Okay, so you've had four seasons. We're in our fourth season of the How To Do It video series. A lot of information. I think there's 50 or 60 videos during that time period, maybe 60. Um, and, you know, one thing that happens with an overdose of information is that where the hell do we get started? And what I say, even when people attend my courses, I say, you know, there's a feel-good factor about the courses. But I'll, I'll, I'll use an analogy. There's an American comedian I uh, heard with this little touch of his humour where he said, I was, I was driving down the road in San Francisco the other day and I saw this bloke with a trolley and his world's possession in the trolley, a homeless guy. And he's pushing this trolley with a very grim look on his face, uh, obviously living a very difficult life. And I thought to myself, look, I could change that difficult life. I could do this right now. I've got a spare room at home. I've got a wardrobe full of clothes I don't wear, much better than the rags this bloke's wearing. I've got mates who could give him jobs. I'm looking for people constantly. I could completely transform this bloke's life. And then I drove on and thought, geez, you're a good bastard for thinking of that. Now, this is what I, I don't want you to do with this information. And what many people say, oh, you went to this course, I went to that course. Yeah, but you didn't do anything. You learned this stuff and you didn't put one thing into practice. And so this is this little presentation is called Getting Started and, and basically, you know, what to do, even one step. So we'll talk about 10 steps and if you can do one of them, it will be a benefit for you, but you need to move, start moving in the direction rather than feeling good about doing some learning. We want some action and this is the action slot. So you've had the overload, here's a 10 point checklist, not necessarily in order of importance, but number one, take away the guesswork. I mean, I was at a course just a couple of days ago, I'm teaching constantly, and there were two people in the room that had ever done tissue tests. And I've said so many times, a tissue test is so basic, even if you do one before flowering, you're just saying, what do you want plant? Oh, that's what you want. I mean, it's so basic. How, do you, how can you grow without asking that question? recognizing that a tissue test will be quite different to a soil test. You can't determine what the plant requires from a soil test because minerals bounce off each other and antagonize and stimulate each other and organic matter plays a role in how well they're uptaken and so forth. You need to ask the plant what it wants occasionally and act accordingly. So a, so a, a good soil test is important. So, you know, this is a good soil test. This is one that we do. Uh, it's called a soil therapy report and it sort of gives you the guidelines of where you need to be and we give you a sort of a program suggesting how you get there. But if, you know, one of the issues with soil testing is if you're in a maybe a, a grazing scenario or a broadacre scenario where it's a pretty low budget kind of cropping scenario, then what's the point of getting back a soil test that needs, it says you need two and a half tonnes of lime and you need a tonne of gypsum and you need 250 kilos of pot sulphate and 20 kilos of zinc to completely correct your soil? when you, know, you haven't got anything like that kind of budget, well, there are other strategies that you can utilize based upon those deficiencies uh, or excesses in the soil. And this can be a simple seed treatment. You've got no zinc and manganese, well, you need them to kickstart a plant, so you put a little bit of zinc and manganese on the seed. You can foliar spray with a kilo of zinc sulfate and some fulvic acid uh, as another alternative. Um, so, or direct inject for some of the things that you require. So there are, there are ways you can address this, at least do something to improve or address your deficiencies or excesses. And of course, the use of Mulder's chart, the 39 year old chart by Professor Mulder that demonstrates this interplay that, that phosphorus shuts down zinc and zinc shuts down phosphorus and calcium shuts down seven minerals if you've overdone calcium. And you can see this all and recognize when you look at your test, well, probably, not always, the LEAP test will guarantee that, but probably my high iron is going to be affecting my very low copper. And so maybe I should put a bit of copper foliar spray, you know, half a kilo of copper sulfate per hectare with 300 grams of soluble fulvic acid powder, for example. So that's removing the guesswork, number one. Number two is the second part. Remember, nutrition farming is minerals, microbes, and humus, and the interplay between those three things. So we're talking now about, we've been talking about soil and leaf tests for checking the mineral part of the component, uh, and now we're talking about checking and checking out your hidden workforce. 
Uh, here and we're talking about a little tool uh, called the microbiometer, which is really, really simple and easy to use. Once you've done it once, we won't go through and demonstrate it, but this simple little tool that measures your workforce. Now, there's very good studies showing that a measure of total microbial biomass, it's not differentiating, saying you've got this many protozoa and this many fungi, it's just saying how big is your workforce. And there are very good studies showing that that simple measurement of total microbial biomass is a really, really important guide as to fertility and productivity in that soil. So the higher the, work, the, higher the reading, the, high, the bigger your workforce and the better you'll do. It's as simple as that. You can go to any farm, show me your best block, show me your worst block. The best block will measure 700 on this little device. The worst block will measure 100 and immediately it dawns on you, oh my goodness, the microbes are making me the money. And it's a very, very handy tool. And it can pick up other things like I've had several reports late, lately of people using high doses of a very inexpensive, I won't mention brand names, but it's a fish based on, on tuna. And it's like a dollar, dollar fifty a litre, which is a really cheap liquid fish. But tuna is notorious for high levels of mercury. Uh, it accumulates mercury. And we're seeing drops, significant drops uh, in readings when they're using high doses of this particular fish. So be aware of that. And this tool can help you identify that. Now, I was on a farm yesterday and they'd put on, you know, tons, 15 cubic metres or 15 tonnes per acre of biosolids. So this is, you know, sewage waste. Uh, and it was free. You think, well, that's a good deal. And we looked at the soil test and there's been this big jump in NPK, particularly phosphorus, had gone from 20 to 120. Uh, and the crops were looking quite reasonable, but they'd done several tests in that same region previously and they measured five, 600, which is the soils up in Kingaroy are very good soils. Just the native soils are really good. It's volcanic soil and they're really, really, really promising soils. You could grow anything in them. And these soils with the, with the biosolids were measuring 200, 220, 250 half of what they previously measured. Now, it's not proven that that's the problem, but it's highly suspicious and you need to look further at the impact of the chemicals and heavy metals that may be present in that biosolid. So even though it's a cheap source of nutrition, it's not necessarily welcomed by the all-important soil life. So this little tool can be uh, quite diverse in terms of how we can utilise it and what we can gain from it. Now, so it measures total micro microbial biomass, but it also measures this hugely important thing when we talk about you know, ratios that will determine your profit, basically. One of them is the fungi to bacteria ratio. Uh, and this tool measures it. And we want to have equal parts, 50% fungi, 50% bacteria. And what we see is 80% bacteria, 20% fungi, 90% bacteria, 10% fungi, 95%, 5%. Uh, we see this decimation of the fungal component of our soil. And when I talk about what we're doing when we grow stuff, I'm talking about gas exchange. You want to have a soil that's open and breathing and you can't really do that without fungi because they create the larger crumbs. They create the larger aggregates to get that soil breathing so beautifully. Uh, and so the fungi to bacteria ratio is massively important. It's one of your chief priorities is to improve that and correct it. And the little, this little tool tells you your fungi to bacteria ratio. And what you find is you need more fungi. And then we can talk about things like the Johnson Sioux bioreactor, which is a great tool to bring in fungal diversity. We can talk about things like humic acid that are very powerful fungal stimulants or kelp, which stimulates fungi along with multiple other benefits. And we can bring those tools and we can use uh, fungal dominated teas and we can use trichoderma to break down crop residues and bring in that particular form of beneficial fungi. We can work if we know what we're working with and we're not guessing and we're checking uh, and correcting that hidden workforce is one of the strategies you're going to adopt hopefully. Um, then we can look at concepts like boosting mineral uptake and microbial activity and this is where humic and fulvic acid come into the equation. These natural substances extracted from a natural material called brown coal we make humic and fulvic acid when we compost, but it turns out that they do kind of, in a concentrated form, all the good things that compost does. And they can almost serve, uh, you know, as, as a substitute in the absence of organic matter in your soil. And they perform a whole range of things, including natural collation and magnifying the uptake of everything you put with them and humic acid feeding fungi and fulvic acid feeding bacteria and the list. And then they produce this oxen-like root and leaf uh, stimulating hormone, this oxen-like hormone. Uh, and the list goes on and on. But if you haven't discovered humic and fulvic acid, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you play around with these two materials. They, there's some good research suggesting that they work really well in conjunction. There's a synergy when you combine them, but no one does that because 
fulvic acid and humic acid are quite different in terms of their compatibility. Fulvic acid goes with everything, humic acid goes with nothing. Well, it goes with it goes with a couple of neutral or alkaline things. It goes with urea and it goes with sodium borate, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but we've discovered a way to make humic acid stay compatible with everything. And so we've combined in this very popular new product, Fulvex, we've combined 50% or half humic and half fulvic together. It's in their 40s, the percentage in there. Half humic, half fulvic, and you can put it with anything at all. So that becomes a great tool to gain the multiple benefits of both of those natural acids. So that's something, even if you started and started playing around with the potential of using Fulvex, at least you've, you've got started. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is um, just experiment for your own sake in adding, just put in on the seed, if, you, if you're direct drilling into a pasture a bit more diversity, coat that seed in a very simple little mycorrhizal inoculum, uh, in our case called platform. There are others on the market. Platform contains trigoderma, it contains some bacillus species as well as five strains of mycorrhizal fungi. But just recognise the benefit of having this organism that drills into the plant root, uh, that expands out over a six week period and gives us 10 times the original root surface area. All the good things the root does are done 10 times more effectively. It's kind of a no brainer that that might be a value, but just try half of a, a row with and half a row without and you'll be sold on the benefits of inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi. They've been the victims of a bunch of our mismanagement, um, they don't like to be sliced and diced and constantly, cult constantly cultivated. They don't like fungicides, obviously. They really hate nematicides uh, and some of the herbicides impact them. So there's a lot of things that have knocked them out. 90% are gone from our soils. Watch what happens when you bring them back. So mycorrhizal fungi, uh, even if we look at the most, des most destructive uh, environmentally and for human health of all farm chemicals, which are root, not ne uh, uh, root uh, nematicides to kill root, not nematodes. Nematicides are really, really nasty chemicals. Even if we look at that story and we say, well, is there any other way? Yeah, there is. Get some mycorrhizal fungi on the roots of your crop because they cannot coexist with root knot nematodes. That's your fungicide. Colonize with mycorrhizal fungi and you will not need root knot. You will not need control for root knot nematodes. So foliar nutrition, you've heard it lots. Uh, wherever I go in the world, it's the thing that everyone's doing. Pasture guys, golf courses are using it. Uh, every kind of orchard crop, every kind of vegetable crop, uh, cotton, uh, broadacre crops of all kinds. Everyone's now recognised this idea of this 12 times more efficient delivery, this much more cost effective way. And now we've got drones, the 50 litre drones delivering foliar nutrition increasingly across the globe. And we've talked about probably the most effective when we talk nitrogen management, we've talked about, this might be one thing that you trial. We've talked about the importance of polyurea, that urea is the amine form of nitrogen, that we put it in the soil and very rapidly it converts through to the ammonium form and then organisms come in and convert most of it to the, in the nitrate form. It goes into the plant, it requires molybdenum to convert it through to a protein, which many of us are lacking, but that process is hugely energetic. It takes 70% of your yield potential of your photosynthetic, everything you're making from photos photosynthesis is used just to convert the nitrate to the first stage of protein. First stage of protein is called an amine. That's what urea is, bypass the whole inefficient off-gassing and leaching and sucking nutrition from the plant and foliar spray 12 times more efficiently, 10, 15 kilos of urea, always with humic acid, always. It doesn't work as well without humic acid. There's a whole synergy that I won't go into now. Humic acid and urea and watch what you can achieve with much, much less nitrogen. And that's important because we're contributing as farmers 80% of the nitrous oxide to the atmosphere and it's 310 times more thickening of that blanket than CO2. So it's a huge story that we can change so easily and be much more uh, profitable in the process. So foliar urea, again, it's about foliar. And foliar calcium is um, hugely important. Of all the minerals that you can benefit from, and we talked about urea, but calcium is probably bigger because a calcium is a slug of all minerals. It is so sluggish. It's hard to get into the plant. Uh, it's hard to move around the plant. And aside from that, there are so many things that impact it. High magnesium can affect calcium, high potassium, high sodium, high nitrogen very commonly can shut down calcium. And if you're lacking fungi, which is almost everyone, fungi help uh, move calcium into the plant. So there's a whole reason for saying most crops will benefit from a foliar spray of calcium. Now, 
What we do know about calcium is that it works in conjunction with boron, and we talk about calcium, the trucker of all minerals, and boron, the steering wheel. And so you want to have a product, and there's one, but you might have, there's others on the market that combine calcium and boron together. Uh, in this case, this product's called Caltech. It's in an amino acid base uh, with, with lots of calcium and lots of boron. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that you might look at. You might make your own version of it. So another simple step you can take just to convince yourself of the validity of doing something, you might do nothing but this. And all I'm suggesting is that you trial 30 to 50 mils of this natural substance called tricontinol 30 to 50 mils per hectare, two tablespoons or three tablespoons is what we're talking about, tiny amounts, foliar spray, because it's part of this foliar story, you can put it through, but you need much more to get the same response. So it's a very, very inexpensive um, plant growth stimulant. Uh, it's not hormonal, it's mode of action. It was uh, discovered in the outer waxy coating of the lucin plant, and it's been described as the most powerful plant growth promotant ever researched. And I've mixed together a lot of formulas and tricontinol is one of the single most powerful and probably the biggest bang for your dollar. So if you do nothing else, trial a little tricontinol and watch what happens. It's mode of action. Every aspect of the most important process, photosynthesis, is boosted. And we're talking about increasing chlorophyll density. You can measure that with your refractometer. We're talking about the opening of the stomate. We're talking about the phosphate-based uh, enzymes that drive the production of sugar. All of these things improve. Uh, in, the, in the uptake of CO2 full stop and so forth, all improve in the, with, with this tiny amounts of this wonderful stuff called tricontinol. So Google the benefits of tricontinol for yourself and you will be amazed. So that's another simple thing that you can trial.